Good evening and welcome to the National Security College uh, here at the Australian National University. Uh, my name is Rory Medcalf, the head of the college. I recognise many familiar faces in the room, but it's always good to see some new uh, friends and supporters and people who are interested in the, uh, the academic and policy debates that we encourage here. I want to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and paying respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Uh, before we get into proceedings, I might also ask you to please put your phones on silent. You don't need to turn them off, especially if you're planning to tweet, because uh, this event is on the public record, but please put your phones on silent. It's a real pleasure to, to convene this evening's discussion because the issues that we're going to be looking at, particularly uh, the, uh, the challenges, the prospects for America's strategic presence and role uh, in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific, and also questions about regional order, including how to counter coercion, including dealing with uh, China's maritime coercion, but also wider strategic issues. The Korean Peninsula looms large. All of these issues uh, are really absolutely core to the work we do here at the National Security College, looking at Australia's national security interests and how we advance and protect them in an uncertain world. It's also very timely, of course, because uh, not, not long from now, uh, Prime Minister Turnbull will, of course, be meeting President Trump um, in the United States, or indeed, uh, I think, uh, on, a, uh, on a ship in, uh, in New York Harbour. Uh, but having a conversation that uh, really will have a lot of significance for the shape of the alliance, the way the alliance works under these, um, I guess, interesting conditions of, um, of, of regional and global uncertainty. The college has done some work recently on what the alliance looks like and what the alliance might look like, uh, including in the context of the Trump administration. Our paper, uh, as some of you will recall, was uh, titled Australia's National Security and the Trump Administration, Don't Panic, Don't Relax. And that, in many ways, I think, has captured the mood for the way Australia is engaging, not only with the, uh, the questions around the Trump administration's engagement with Asia, but also the changing regional power dynamics and the way that others, uh, whether it's China, whether it's North Korea, whether it's others, uh, are really trying to either take initiative or respond to these, these new circumstances. We've got two speakers here this evening uh, visiting from the United States who have very distinct insights on these issues, uh, very distinct uh, and very uh, distinguished practitioner insights, but also deep analytical uh, perspectives. And so I'll say a few words to introduce our two speakers who will each speak uh, for about 10 to 15 minutes to begin with, but then uh, who uh, are very happy to join us in a discussion, uh, a question and answer session on these, uh, on these issues. Uh, the first of our speakers this evening is Ambassador David Shear. Uh, now, Ambassador Shear is uh, a very eminent and distinguished policy maker and practitioner in America's engagement with Asia, with the Indo-Pacific, but particularly, I think, with, uh, with North Asia and uh, also with Vietnam in Southeast Asia. Uh, David Shear's most recent positions uh, have included as Assistant Secretary of Defence for Asia-Pacific Security Affairs uh, between uh, 2014 and 2016 in the Obama administration, and also Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Defence for Policy uh, uh, for uh, an overlapping, overlapping period of time. Now, his uh, previous career highlights have included as Ambassador to Vietnam, uh, where he played a, a key role in the, uh, the really strengthened engagement, the strategic engagement between the United States and Vietnam that perhaps we don't hear enough about um, in this country when we take often quite a China-centric view of the changing regional order, but also uh, senior roles in, state, uh, in the State Department following a long career uh, of engagement with, uh, with the region. Um, I'll shortly uh, introduce our second speaker, but first it's a real pleasure to hear some perspectives from Ambassador Shea. Thank you very much, Rory, and thanks to ANU and the US Studies Center for inviting me to join you tonight, and it's great to be back in Australia with my Alliance friends. I spent 32 years as a professional diplomat in the State Department uh, and ended my career in the State Department after I finished in Vietnam in 2014. When I joined the Defense Department, I joined as an Obama administration political appointee, so I turned into a pumpkin at noon on January 20 uh, on Inauguration Day, and I'd like to share with you some of the questions 
I've been asking myself since Inauguration Day about the Trump administration approach to East Asia, as well as some of the answers that I've come to as I've thought through these questions. Um, and I think the first thing to say is, uh, the first thing to say about um, American interests and American behavior in the region in the Trump administration, uh, as well as in previous administrations, is that the United States has enduring strong, deep interests in this region that aren't going to change, no matter who is president. And over time, the behavior of our, our presidents is going to hew to those, those interests because they really are strong and enduring interests. And that goes for our interests in maintaining strong alliances throughout the region, including with Australia. But some of the questions I've been asking myself are, uh, will we uh, maintain continuity with uh, our bilateral relationships throughout the region? Um, will we continue to pay the kind of strong interest in Southeast Asia that the Obama administration paid to the region? And third, uh, will the Trump administration pursue uh, not just uh, bilateral hub and spokes style policies towards our allies, our partners, and other countries in the region? Or will it uh, adopt and pursue uh, a, regional a regional strategy as President Obama did in the so-called rebalance strategy toward the region, which was really a signature policy of the Obama administration? Let's look at our bilateral relationships first. And I think President Trump caused some concern during the transition and during the early days of the administration um, in, in some of his tweets and phone calls, particularly his, um, his statements with regard to Taiwan, particularly his early uh, phone call early in his uh, administration with uh, Prime Minister Turnbull. But um, since that time, I think we've seen the emergence of fairly strong continuity in our bilateral relationships throughout the region. And that was demonstrated earliest by Secretary of Defense Mattis, Mattis's visit to Japan and the ROK. It was demonstrated by um, uh, Secretary Tillerson's uh, visits to Tokyo, Seoul, and Beijing, as well as by uh, 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 President Trump's embrace of the One China policy and his successful meeting, bilateral meeting at Mar-a-Lago with Prime Minister Xi. And I think the, the meeting with Prime Minister Xi in particular demonstrated that uh, uh, President Trump understands the importance of a stable uh, relationship between the United States and China. And of course, Vice President Pence in his recent trip uh, to Northeast Asia, to Australia, and to Indonesia again demonstrated strong continuity in our, our approaches to our Australian friends and to uh, uh, Indonesia as well. Um, that leaves the question of uh, Southeast Asia. Um, will, will the administration pay as much attention to Southeast Asia as the Obama administration d did? Um, President Obama had a strong personal interest in the region. Of course, he, he spent time growing up in Indonesia. He spoke, he spoke some Bahasa, and he used it while he was there. Um, uh, but it went beyond uh, President Obama's per personal attachment to, to the region, to the growing importance the United States places on Southeast Asia, and to Oceania as well. Um, and I think Vice President Pence's uh, uh, visit to Indonesia was a good start. He visited, while he was in Jakarta, the, uh, the uh, ASEAN Secretariat, and there announced that President Trump will be participating in the APEC and East Asia summits uh, in the fall. Uh, President Trump will host a US ASEAN uh, uh, summit meeting while he's in the region. Um, and since that time, we've also done a number of things that I think demonstrate a uh, strong trend towards continuity towards Southeast Asia, including uh, visits to Washington by the Singapore, uh, Malaysia, and Viet Vietnamese foreign ministers, 
President Trump uh, recently invited to Washington the Thai, Singaporean, and Philippine, uh, his Thai, Singapore, and Philippine uh, counterparts. And you may not, um, you may not have agreed with the way in which President Trump announced his invitation to Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte, in which the president praised Duterte's uh, uh, approach to uh, Philippine drug problems. But um, Philippines is, is, an important, is an important ally. And it's our hope that um, not only, not only uh, will the president have uh, a good visit to Manila um, for the East Asia Summit, but that uh, we can exchange our views not only on security and economic issues, but on human rights as well during President Duterte's visit to Washington. I expect that uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis will attend the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore coming up uh, uh, early next month, I believe. Um, I hope he will deliver a speech on the region. Um, and it will be important for him to do so, I think, because one thing, despite the, the apparent emerging continuity in Trump administration policy toward the region, one thing it, it appears to lack so far is a, is a strong regional strategy. Um, we, we need to bring together all of the strands of our activities, all of the strands given to us by our bilateral alliances, into a, into a strong um, regional policy focused on China's rise and focused on the economic opportunities that China and the rest of the uh, region present as well. And I think uh, both Secretary of Defense Mattis's uh, trip to Singapore, um, which I, hasn't been announced, but I hope he'll take, um, uh, as well as the President's uh, uh, presence at the APEC and uh, uh, EAF, East Asia summits will give the, the uh, administration an opportunity to uh, articulate a strong uh, regional policy. It's difficult for me uh, in concluding to talk, to give you um, a lot of opti optimism about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a, a fundamentally important initiative, um, and it was important not just because it offered uh, its participants uh, strong economic opportunities, strong economic benefits, it was strategic as well, because it gave our TPP partners uh, the opportunity to strongly diversify their trading relationships in a region in which the Chinese economy is more and more dominant. It also gave the United States and our TPP partners uh, the opportunity to have the strongest possible uh, hand in shaping the rules by which the regional trading system would operate in the 21st century. And this is part of what we mean when we talk about preserving and growing the rules-based order. It's about the United States and its allies and like-minded partners joining together to define how the region is going, going to operate uh, in the future. And we can do that with the Chinese as well. This, this, this rules-based regional order is not going to be monopolized by the United States and its allies in the future. What emerges over the next couple of decades is going to be something that we, we all work on with China, and that's where our alliances come in. Our alliances give us the strongest possible leverage in what will be a, a, a diplomatic approach to shaping this region. So, I think it's uh, critically important that the United States continue to strengthen it, its alliance. I think it's critically important that uh, President Trump and Prime Minister Turnbull have a, a good uh, meeting tonight. Um, and it's critically important that we all work together to uh, generate the maximum leverage we need to uh, define the rules-based order that will govern this uh, this international system in this region in, in the remaining years of the 21st century. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, thanks for those those words, uh, Ambassador Shear. And I think uh, that's really opened the conversation. A lot of angles that I think we can can and should pursue uh, a little bit later in in the evening. I think the emphasis on the alliance and on the need for the alliance to adapt and adjust to new circumstances, the uh, the fact that the challenges in the region, if you like, haven't changed from one administration to the next, uh, but, that, but that Australia and the United States and others, uh, because we have to remember that there is, I think, in my view, an emerging multipolarity in the region, uh, are all looking to posi position themselves and to find as much continuity as they can to manage those challenges. You've brought all of those out and we'll, we'll discuss those in a moment. Um, I would, uh, in introducing our second speaker, note that um, I think one of, the, one of the things we try to do here at the college is to really build that bridge between uh, policy and, uh, and research, uh, that, that real praxis that um, I think is so necessary uh, in Australia's national security community. And, and Dr Zach Cooper is really someone who does that. Um, uh, Zach Cooper, who I'll invite up in a moment, uh, despite his, uh, his apparent youth, uh, has, um, has uh, really made a very significant contribution to the, uh, the shaping of policy, the understanding of Asia you know, in the US um, strategic and, uh, and security community. Um, now, uh, Dr Cooper at the moment is Senior Fellow for Asian Security at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies in Washington DC, one of the leading think tanks in the United States, but has also worked in policy uh, in the Pentagon, also in the White House, and as well as his own research has been closely associated with the uh, Asian Maritime Transparency Initiative. Uh, you'll know what this is when you think about those photographs you see quite frequently now of Chinese uh, island building and the militarisation of those islands in the South China Sea. Uh, that initiative uh, that Zach, Zach is associated with uh, has been responsible really for uh, the, uh, the transparency and the publication of, um, of, uh, of those pictures. So I'll invite Zach up in a moment, but before I do I might note uh, that of course working here in partnership with the US Studies Centre, uh, which I uh, should have acknowledged at the beginning, uh, the National Security College is seeking to continue to develop a community of practice on these issues in Australia. But uh, Zach Cooper, the floor is yours. Rory, thank you so much for having me in the US Studies Centre as well. It's a, it's a real treat as an American to be able to go somewhere and talk with an alliance, about an alliance, and get so many interested folks. Uh, you know, one of the challenges in working in Washington on the U.S.-Australia alliance is that often I think our community is smaller in Washington than it should be. Uh, and so there's so much debate happening here on the alliance, but not enough happening in Washington. And so it's, it's wonderful to be able to get here and talk about the alliance in detail. Um, I wanted to talk about what I think is maybe the core challenge for the alliance in the next 10 or 20 years, which is the rules-based global order. Right. This is the term that Australia has put forward repeatedly and done, I think, some important work to define. But the key element of the rules based global order that I think we've had an incredible amount of uh, problems enforcing is the rules regarding the activities that China has pursued in the South China Sea and to some extent the East China Sea over the last seven years. And uh, CSIS has been leading a large project the last year, which we will roll out in the next few weeks on countering coercion in maritime Asia, which is looking at how the United States and its allies and partners in the region could do more to counter Chinese coercion especially. And I want to briefly walk you through the project and why I think it's important and what more we could do to <coughs> counter Chinese coercion. Uh, and the, the core uh, reason that we need to pay more attention to this is that, as many of you know, uh, the Chinese have been pursuing what uh, the Japanese call gray zone coercion, right? So this is coercion that doesn't cross the threshold to conventional conflict, but goes just below it at a level that's more difficult to push back against. And I think the, the conventional wisdom in the United States, at least, and, and to some extent in the region, has been that we have very few options for pushing back against this kind of coercion, and that therefore the rules-based global order which we've all learned to rely so heavily upon, is going to be under threat. It will degrade over time. And this leads to real questions, not only about the order itself, but about the virtues and value of the US-Australia alliance. And uh, the argument I want to make is that it's not a, as bleak a picture as some folks make it out to be. And so let me begin by arguing that, in fact, when people talk about coercive activities 
uh, in the South China Sea, things like the building of seven islands in the South China Sea by China, uh, which did not previously exist, three of which now have 3,000 meter airfields on them with 24 fighter hangars on each. Uh, these kinds of activities have certainly undermined the order, but there are a whole set of activities that the Chinese have attempted to pursue over the last seven years, which have actually failed. And so it's important for us to realize that it is possible, in fact, for us to push back against these efforts to change that order and to uphold the rules-based global order and the regional order, in fact, in ways that uh, can deter conflict and simultaneously uh, avoid a war, I think, down the line over these kinds of issues. So let me just briefly walk through uh, the kinds of cases that we looked at. Uh, we, we looked at nine, as I said, from 2009 to today. And uh, they covered the gamut, everything from maritime disputes, such as an incident in 2009 over the USNS Impeccable, in which uh, some Chinese ships uh, attempted to stop that surveillance ship operating near the Chinese coast, uh, to aircraft flying uh, off the Chinese coast again, conducting operations in international airspace freely as they should be able to, but were again challenged uh, by the PLA to things like the Scarborough Shoal standoff in 2012, uh, in which China uh, in the Philippines engaged in a standoff. It was in some ways mediated by the United States, and the outcome was that China gained more control over Scarborough Shoal. Uh, it's an important incident in which I think the rules-based global order was undermined. Uh, and then a couple of others, things like the Vietnam-China uh, oil rig standoff. Uh, in which China put an oil rig into waters that are disputed by Vietnam uh, and, in fact, was forced to pull out the oil rig earlier than it had planned. So we looked at nine of these cases. And as I said, the conventional wisdom is that the US, Australia, and others have very few options to push back against these kinds of coercive efforts. And what we found was, in fact, that in only two of the nine cases had the Chinese coercion been entirely effective. So in seven of these nine cases that we look at, actually the Chinese either failed or you had a mixed outcome. And so uh, as a scholar, I like that because it tells us that there's some variation here. There's something for us to study. And it means that uh, we can be successful in some of these cases. So I want to suggest a couple of uh, ways to think about where the Chinese are pushing and how we can push back and uphold that rules-based global order and then end with some thoughts about how the alliance can do better in that area. So in my view, the Chinese have been trying to change two different things. One is physical control of features and territory, and the other is the rules and norms, right, that undermine our existing order. And when they do so, they can do so in one of two ways. They can either try and control, or sorry, they can either try to contest that physical control, or they can try and contest the rules and norms. Or on the other hand, they can try and exploit control they already have, or exploit rules and norms that already exist. And one thing we found in our study was that these are entirely different categories. So let me give you one example. Uh, when the Chinese try to contest rules and norms, they tend to just do a limited probe. So this is an effort basically to see if they can change a rule and norm, and if there's going to be any response. And if there's a response, they back down very quickly. So one example is uh, challenges to surveillance operations off the Chinese coast, which the United States, Australia, and most other countries in the world believe are very much in accordance with international law and the Chinese dispute. And sometimes the Chinese will challenge those types of operations. Well, if other countries come back and demonstrate that they're willing to accept a little bit of risk to uphold the rules-based order, turns out the Chinese almost always back down and they do so quickly. And so this is an easy deterrence case. There are other cases that are much more difficult. For example, when the Chinese already have physical control and they're trying to exploit it in, say, the Spratly Islands, uh, it's almost impossible to stop the Chinese from militarizing, uh, say, the Spratly Islands once they already have control of those features one would have to accept a tremendous amount of risk to do so. And so we find that that is going to be a hard <coughs> deterrence case. Uh, and then there are other cases like contestation of physical control. Uh, and here what the Chinese are typically doing is ratcheting up pressure. 
So this is very different than what I talked about just a second ago, the limited probe, right, where the Chinese will test and back down if they get uh, a hard response from their adversary. Here, it, in the controlled pressure strategy, they will ratchet up the pressure. And if the other side ratchets up also, they just wait a little bit and go higher. They don't back down again. And so um, what we see in these cases is very different approaches by the Chinese that require very different strategies. And that is, I think, something that has often been uh, ignored in the public, is that when you think about changes to the rules-based order, there are very different kinds of changes. And some of them we can respond very effectively against, and others will be far more difficult. And so I think the challenge for policymakers and for the Trump administration going forward is to identify those types of activities that they want to deter and send clear messages to China about which activities they will deter and what risk the United States and other countries in the region are willing to accept to do so. So let me just leave you with uh, five thoughts about some principles that I think are important, not just for the United States, but for Australia in doing so. The first, as I said, is that it's important to tailor deterrence strategies to the different kinds of incidents that are occurring. The second is that it is often valuable to very actively signal a specific commitment in those cases where the United States intends to deter an action. Uh, so let me give you one example, which is the Senkaku Diayu dispute. So the Japanese uh, and the Chinese and the Taiwans also, uh, they dispute these island features. And the US takes no position on the dispute itself, other than its desire to have it resolved peacefully and without coercion. But uh, Article 5 of the US-Japan Security Treaty does apply to that dispute. And the United States has made that quite clear. And so we've seen uh, a relatively stable situation since the US made that clear. Whereas in the South China Sea, where uh, commitments are more ambiguous, it's been much more difficult for the U.S. to demonstrate its deterrent commitment and convince China that it is serious in those kinds of cases. A third principle is that if the U.S. is going to demonstrate this kind of deterrent commitment, it has to hug its allies close. Uh, and this is, I think, particularly important uh, when you're talking about accepting more risk. So if the US is going to push back hard on Chinese coercion, there's some who would say, well, you don't want to let an ally get too far out in front of you. You should distance yourself from that ally if you're worried about their actions. But in fact, what we found in our research is you want to hug your ally tighter when you're worried about the activities they might conduct. And that way, you have more control over their actions. Uh, a fourth principle is, is a pretty basic one, but is that uh, deterrence requires some acceptance of risk. Thomas Schelling, who's the dean of deterrence theory, said that uh, deterrence is basically requires the commitment to leave things up to chance, right? And uh, if you are not willing to accept any risk, you're not willing to take any chances, then you cannot deter. Uh, so deterrence requires some risk acceptance, but it requires that that risk acceptance be quite calculated. And then finally, the last principle I would say is, I think all of these things can be done, but they must be done in a context in which the United States and Australia and other states reach out to our Chinese friends and explain to them what the US strategy is, what the Australian strategy is, and have a very direct dialogue about what we think is permissible and impermissible to uphold that rules-based order. And that's a dialogue that I think has happened to some degree, but uh, certainly could be stronger. And I think some clear messaging will be absolutely critical. So with that, let me get off the stage, but just make a one, one plea that I, I think often the US-Australia uh, alliance doesn't discuss these tough issues as directly as we should. You know, there's clearly a debate here in Australia about uh, the Australia-China relationship, and there's one happening simultaneously in the United States. But we don't talk together as much about this type of issue as I think we should. So it's one reason that I'm happy that uh, the Australian National University and the US Studies Center have been kind enough to have us down here and uh, be part of this discussion here, both in Canberra and in Sydney. So with that, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Zach Cooper. And uh, we've got some time now for some questions for our visitors. I might uh, take advantage of the, uh, the, the privilege of uh, 
uh, of being convener here to perhaps begin with one or two questions for our guests who, uh, uh, among other things, have um, had a conversation with some of our master's students here this afternoon at the college, so uh, really trying to put practitioner voices in, in front of the students. And one of the issues I think that, uh, that came up in that conversation, which I think you've touched on there, Zach, but I'd be interested to hear more from both of you about, is this question about the, the character of the alliance, the Australia-US alliance, but also the other alliances in the region. Uh, because I think that um, you know, you've, you've seen some of the, the lively debate in the country at the moment about uh, how we respond to strategic change uh, and really how we define the alliance and perhaps uh, how we perhaps need a greater explanation of the, uh, the evolution of the alliance here. Uh, and and that, that conversation includes elements like the, um, the history of the Alliance, the fact that there's been a very strong, if you like, almost sentimental edge to uh, looking at the Alliance, and we'll see a bit of that reflected, I think, in the, the meeting um, overnight in New York, but also the fact that, um, that countries' uh, behaviour and strategic balancing and, and, and building stability are based on interests and are based on defining their interests. So I wonder if, uh, if either or both of you would like to maybe begin by commenting a bit more about how you see the alliance being defined in a, uh, a way that's, um, that is truly politically sustainable? Well, I think one of the virtues of the US-Australia alliance is that it, in some ways for the United States, it is an easy alliance. Uh, it, it is an alliance where we don't have great concern, uh, as my colleague Ashley Townsend was saying earlier, about being drawn into a conflict. Uh, so we can have great confidence uh, that there's safety in the U.S.-Australia alliance uh, from the American perspective, uh, but also great confidence that Australia will go fight abroad uh, with us when, when needed. And this is often the line that you hear said at every, uh, every event. It's almost, it's almost like a requirement, right, that the United States and Australia have fought together in every major conflict since World War I. And in some ways, this makes it almost easy for us not to think uh, in, in the United States in a serious way about the needing to invest in the alliance. Because the message to some Americans is Australia has always been there and Australia will always be there. And it's easy, therefore, to take the alliance for granted. And I, I think this is a bit of a danger. Um, and, and the danger is that it, any alliance is basically just a relationship. And in any relationship, you have to talk about the hard issues and if you don't talk about the hard issues, uh, they eventually become more problematic and very difficult to overcome. And I think uh, for, at times, the US and Australia haven't really talked about some of the hard issues. And I think China and its rise and its impact is one of those issues where we have some different opinions. We have very similar interests and very similar values, but some different opinions. And I think the, the important thing for us as an alliance is to talk directly to each other about those views. And I think that's healthy and actually will strengthen the alliance. And so I, I think it's a debate that we should welcome uh, and, and engage in directly. I've been working with allies in, in East Asia for a long time, including Japan and, and Australia. And I've always found that, um, particularly in times of uncertainty, um, particularly now given the rise of China, that the single most important thing that we can do is uh, ensure that both sides know what the other side's interests are. Both sides know where we might, uh, where, where we, not only where we agree, but where we might diverge. Um, so transparency is extremely important uh, in, in uh, forging uh, a stronger, stronger, uh, more durable alliance. And that's not, not just true with Australia, it's true with our other alliances as well. And we will be going through some of the same conversations with our other allies that we will be going through with Australia as we move forward. G'day, I'm Liam. I graduated from the National Security College last year, worked for KPMG. Um, so Dr. Cooper, thanks for uh, your contribution. Um, I think there's a lot that, uh, to reflect on there. Um, I think it's pretty clear that Trump offends domestic sensibilities in Australia. Um, and, but you're asking us as, as, a, as a sort of as a, uh, a state to take on more risk in, in the South China Sea. Um, polling suggests that the Trump administration uh, uh, is having impacts in the Australian body politic that, that might make 
taking on more risk in areas like the South China Sea, more um, difficult to prosecute in, in a domestic political sense. Um, do you think that's well understood in Washington? And how can we have that voice heard more in, in America so that we can work towards um, sort of aligning our, our interests better uh, in, in that sort of vein? You know, I, frankly, I don't think it's uh, particularly well understood in Washington. I, we would benefit from a Australia study center. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, when you go to talk about the alliance in Washington, it, it's hard to find a large audience that focuses on the alliance, right? That, that's not true of a lot of U.S. alliances. You know, if, if you uh, look at the Japan community, it's, it's been larger uh, or Korea, right? And so in some ways, I, I think that's one of the challenges is that we almost take for granted our relationship. And it's not because we don't care about Australia. It's because the ties have been so good for so long that we underappreciate how important they are. Uh, we almost build it into our model of, of East Asia. It's an assumption that we can rely on a very close alliance. And so I think it's something we need to reinvest in. What I would say uh, just briefly is, you know, there are other alliances that have been through challenging times, and, and one that I spent some time on is Japan. And if you think about what the, what's going on in the U.S.-Japan alliance in the 1990s, it was, I think, far more difficult to chart a future in the U.S.-Japan alliance in the 90s than it would be today for the U.S. and Australia. And essentially what happened is uh, experts on both sides of the Pacific got together and tried to think forward about what the alliance should be. And I, I think that's what needs to happen now, is we need to start developing a consensus, not within the elites, but also within the public, about the issues that we agree on and where we disagree. And, and I think, as I said, you know, address these very directly. And there may be areas where we disagree and where one country uh, goes forward and the other waits. Uh, and that, that's fine. That, that is important in alliances. We don't always need to be having the same policies. The strength and sometimes is actually in having different policies but pursuing them in a coordinated fashion. Thank you and um, thanks so much for um, uh, coming and speaking to us. Um, so my question, my name is Primrose, I'm a reporter at The Australian. Um, I have a question about um, the, um, my first question was about um, One Belt, One Road, which is the um, Chinese infrastructure program. Um, what do you think is um, Washington's attitude to that um, in Australia? We've had our opposition party urge the government to sign up to it, and obviously New Zealand just signed an MOU about it. Um, and um, so how do you think Australia should respond to that? Um, my second question, sorry to do two, but um, was about um, the um, recent New York, New York Times report about um, freedom of navigation exercises in the South China Sea um, and um, uncertainty in Asia as well with ASEAN, questions about ASEAN's independence being undermined. Um, how should Australia respond? And um, do you think we should sort of conduct our own pivot towards Asia? With regard to One Belt, One Road, of course, uh, Chinese uh, uh, investment in the region presents uh, huge economic opportunities to the uh, countries neighboring China, um, as well as to the, region, to the region as a whole. And I think in considering whether or not to participate in One Belt, One Road, and how much, um, Australia should consider what its uh, uh, economic interests are, and you've been very good at that so far, and I expect you'll do very well at it um, in relation to the opportunities that China presents. Um, one Belt, One Road presents opportunities to the United States firms as well. We've been a little less enthusiastic about pursuing some of the official uh, opportunities that One Belt, One Road presents. We, we are not participating in the Asia Infrastructure uh, Develop, Development Bank. Um, I think that personally think that was a mistake. I think over time you'll see the U.S. participating more uh, enthusiastically in One Belt, One Road. I think as we do that, however, um, we'll need to consider what our strategic and security interests are as well, because Chinese economic opportunities are rarely divorced from strategic oppor opportunities 
in the Chinese mind. So we're, we're going to have to, um, from the U.S. perspective at least, I think we're going to have to balance our economic uh, interests with our security interests as we uh, watch how the Chinese develop the One Belt, One Road initiative. Yeah, I think, I think freedom of navigation uh, assertions are very important in demonstrating for the United States, our commitment to freedom of navigation, and we've always welcomed uh, other allies and partners to, to do freedom of navigation operations. I do, however, think that the issue of uh, freedom of navigation operations, it tends to be uh, exaggerated in the press. Um, they're important, but they're not an essential, they're, they're not a, uh, um, uh, uh, the main element of our, our strategy in the South China Sea. So we're going to do a freedom of navigation operations, I'm sure, when the opportunity presents itself. But um, when you look, when you pull back and you look at what the U.S. Navy and the Air, U.S. Air Force are, are doing in the South China Sea, and you look at the extent of Chinese claims, every time a U.S. ship operates anywhere in the South China Sea, we're challenging the Chinese nine dash claim. So in, in the broadest sense, we're conducting a freedom of navigation operation every time we send an aircraft carrier, a destroyer, or an aircraft in, into the area delimited by the Chinese nine dash claim, which we know is not consistent with international law. So, um, and just as a point of clarity, I think on One Belt, One Road, I think what's interesting is that um, in a sense, many countries in the region, including Australia, are certainly participating in uh, particular projects under that rubric. I think the question becomes one about whether, whether in fact, you automatically sign up to everything that's captured under that, uh, that rubric, uh, including the security elements, or whether you can, in fact, pick and choose. So I think that's, a, that's quite a live issue uh, in the Australian policy debate and in the wider region. We'll take um, another couple of questions. I'll come back to Sir at the front, but I think I saw a hand raised uh, towards the middle of the room, uh, the middle of the room over here. This gentleman at the, towards the back. Greg Jarosch, uh, National Security College alumni. Just a quick question. With all the probing and testing of the rules-based order, what aspects of that order is a particular thorn in the side of uh, certain Asian nations that creates this environment for Let's test, let's probe, let's see where the weaknesses lie. Let's, is it a lack of understanding? Is it more than that? Uh, you know, my view is that it, what we're seeing from China is just very typical of any rising power, right? Uh, China did not have a large hand in creating the order that currently exists. And so it is, in many senses, natural for China to want to change that order. Uh, you know, the United States itself, when we were rising, uh, we certainly wanted to change elements of the order. Um, and so I, I think we have to be careful not to assume that Chinese have, that the Chinese government has uh, malevolent intentions in what it's trying to do to alter the order, but just that as China rises, it will try to uh, match its growing power with a growing say in the order that exists. Now, that being said, I think there are certain parts of the order that we should be willing to adapt. Uh, so, you know, Ambassador Shear mentioned the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. I think that's, as, as he said, was a mistake by the US not to be more supportive of Chinese efforts to take a more leading role on some of these economic issues, especially the infrastructure needs. Um, on the security side, though, I, I think that's a much, uh, much more difficult area. And you know, freedom of navigation and overflight, for, for me at least, are one of the absolutely critical areas which are non-negotiable, not just for the United States, but for other countries in the region. I think our alliances are critically important as well. And I don't think you'll see the US anytime soon seeking to dilute our alliances or uh, reduce our forward military presence here um, at the request of the Chinese. Um, so I think, I think our commitment to our alliances is going to remain strong. Um, and, and it's not just a, a straight 
hard power security issue for us. As I suggested in my remarks, our, our alliances give the United States and our alliance partners, I think, a great deal of leverage in the diplomatic process that is going to uh, result in whatever changes in the rules-based order there are. So the, the, the more leverage we have as allies, the better it's going to turn out for us. I'll just um, pivot the conversation, if I may, a little bit, because I think one issue that's on many minds here is North Korea and the Korean Peninsula, uh, what's happening there. And I think when you talked about coercion earlier, <coughs> Zach, uh, in, your, in your piece, and uh, Ambassador Xi, when you talked about the, the alliance system in the region, I think, of course, one of the, uh, the real pressure points at the moment is what's happening on the Korean Peninsula. Now, there's a few elements to this. One, of course, I mean, a key one being, of course, uh, what, in fact, uh, the North Korean regime is trying to achieve through its, uh, it, it, its testing and its, uh, uh, its rhetoric and its, and its really quite belligerent behaviour, but also the question about China's role. Uh, uh, interestingly, when we look at coercion, we look at what China's trying to do not only to influence North Korea, but also to influence South Korea, putting pressure on it to stop hosting missile defences, for example, against North Korean missiles. So I'm wondering... I'm wondering if either or both of you could offer a, uh, an assessment of, of, of how you see uh, the Korean scenario unfolding uh, and, and I guess what the net effect of uh, the Trump administration's uh, apparent uh, policies on this is going to be. Uh, there's, there's a big one for either of you. Sure. Um, the, the prospect of uh, a North Korea that can deliver a nuclear weapon via an, an ICBM to the continental United States, as well as having the capability to deliver a nuclear weapon to uh, our allies, Japan and the ROK, changes the strategic calculus on the uh, Korean Peninsula drastically. Um, it has affected South Korean and Japanese confidence in our extended deterrent, in the credibility of the nuclear umbrella it has led to the deployment uh, of the U.S. THAAD anti-ballistic missile system to the Korean Peninsula. It has raised tensions on the peninsula overall. And on, on the positive side, it has greatly improved uh, relations between Japan and the ROK. Um, and the U.S. has certainly taken advantage of that uh, improvement by fostering a trilateral relationship among Japan, the ROK, and the U.S. Um, that I think is beneficial for all three partners as well as for the region as a whole. But um, the prospect of uh, Kim Jong-un having an ICBM with a nuclear, deliverable nuclear weapon in, a, in, his, in his arsenal is um, a fundamental threat to the security of the American homeland. And it's something that President Trump um, has, has taken extremely seriously since he was briefed on this subject by President Obama in the, uh, dur during the transition. Um, and I, I think uh, the Trump administration has gone about um, addressing this problem a lot like the Obama administration was addressing it, despite the fact that um, the, the new administration has denied that it's pursuing a policy of uh, strategic patience. Um, the next step that had to be taken was increasing pressure on North Korea. And to do that, you have to more deeply engage the Chinese and get the Chinese to cooperate more closely. Um, so whatever option um, the administration were to pursue, it would have to start by getting the Chinese to cooperate on putting more pressure on North Korea. Now, the options are very difficult, and Secretary Tillerson and the President and Secretary of Defense Mattis have all said that the military option is still on the table. You have to say that um, to get North Korean attention and to continue deterring them as well. Um, they've said that um, uh, uh, North Korea will have to um, uh, change its behavior in order for us to uh, conduct negotiations with them and change its approach to denuclearization. I'm not certain that North Korea will ever denuclearize, 
Um, it may be that we may have to settle for something like a freeze. I don't know what the administration is is willing to accept in that regard, but whatever it whatever that option is, it will start with um, increased pressure on North Korea. So I think the the administration is is taking the right track on this. My name is Nick Law, I work at the ANU. I'd like to take probably a step back just to the South China Sea question from Korea. Um, so in the space of essentially 10 months, we've gone from the arbitration ruling in July last year where the US and the Philippines were essentially on the brink of organizing an international coalition demanding Chinese recourse. So we've gone from that point to now where arguably Xi is more or less dictating the status quo of the, of the maritime region and the general situation. So my question being, uh, considering how quickly that status quo is uh, pivoted, I guess, what mistakes or what are the prime mistakes you think um, Xi or China at large could make uh, to essentially overstep or overreach um, and maybe, I guess, create a situation where that um, coordinated international, I guess, coalition of resistance would be sort of renewed to a point where China would really have to take a step back? Um, I would point out five concerns that I have. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll list them. The first is a direct challenge against uh, ships or aircraft conducting surveillance operations. Uh, in China's exclusive economic zone, which China says is not permissible, but which international law, in my view, is quite clear on that it is permissible. So that's one. A second one is uh, any effort by China to announce a South China Sea air defense identification zone. A third concern would be, it's a bit technical, but Chinese announcement of straight baselines around the Spratly Islands. So this would essentially claim the Spratleys as uh, internal waters. Uh, a fourth concern that I have is a Chinese effort to push another claimant off of a disputed feature. Uh, so the, the one that is probably the most concerning target would be Second Thomas Shoal, where the Philippines has a uh, ship beached. Uh, <laughs> and the last one is uh, Scarborough Shoal, where there, a year ago, almost exactly, were real concerns that the Chinese might reclaim land. Uh, and so for me, those are the five worries that I have. Now, I actually don't think that the United States and Australia can deter all of those activities. Uh, there's some of them that I think we're unlikely to be able to deter, but which we should make quite clear to the Chinese, they will pay a cost for doing. So something like announcing an air defense identification zone, you know, that's, that's an ultimatum on their part. We cannot follow the ultimatum, but we can't stop them from announcing it. Uh, but I, I think that's going to be the real challenge for the new administration in Washington is to determine beforehand which, one is, which ones of these kinds of activities they can stop and then to communicate that to China before they start the activity, because if we let them take the activity and then try and respond, it's going to be too late. Uh, hello, David Goyne. Uh, I guess I'm speaking for myself. Uh, I guess my question is adjusted to Ambassador Shear. I'm sort of wanting to draw on your experience working inside a bureaucracy here in an administration. Uh, I take your point about continuing US interests, and I think that's, you know, that they will be enduring. I think there's been surprisingly good picks at the senior official levels who have said all the right things in their engagement in the region. But doesn't the centre matter? In other words, you know, does it matter who's em emperor in Rome, whether it's Augustus or Tiberius or <laughs> Nero? Make that what you will. Well, I think, I think President Trump is neither Augustus, Nero, or Caligula. <laughs> um, I, I, I think he's President Trump, and, and he is on a learning curve. Um, I think his administration is on a learning curve. I think he has chosen good people for key jobs, like Secretaries Tillerson and Mattis, and uh, National Security Advisor McMaster. And I think o over time, you'll see that um, 
they will have strong voices in the way in which American policy is shaped. So um, I, I would say, watch what we do, not what we tweet. Hi, Chris Farnham, National Security College. I just wanted to go back to uh, your response on uh, North Korea, Ambassador Xi, and you're talking about you, you would like to see more cooperation from China in, in um, bringing North Korea into line or, or making it less of a threat. I'd like to know um, some real concrete actions that China might take and with in mind that China is fearful of actually uh, causing a breakdown of order in North Korea in terms of uh, starvation or anything like that. So. Uh, economic sanctions are a realistic lever for China to use to actually influence North Korea's behavior? Um, in general, my sense is that China has a strong interest uh, in stability in North Korea. Um, and its interest in stability sometimes uh, exceeds its interest in denuclearization on the peninsula. Um, and that has led China often to do the minimum when it comes to imposing uh, sanctions on North Korea. I do think there's a lot more that the Chinese can do. There are very strong economic connections across the, uh, the uh, North Korean border with Northeast China. And I think there's more the Chinese can do to implement existing uh, Security Council sanctions. We've all seen some of the, some of the examples. One is further tightening uh, the import of uh, North uh, Korean coal. One is reducing or stopping the flow of oil or various aviation fuels uh, to North Korea. One is for the Chinese to exert uh, more discipline on their banking system, particularly local banks in, in North, North, Northeast China. And they've already taken some steps to do that, I think they need to do more. Um, the, other, the other area where we can do more, I think, is, is um, ensuring that the rest of the international community faithfully implements existing uh, Security Council resolutions. And I think that's why Secretary Tillerson addressed the Security Council uh, a week or 10 days ago now. Um, uh, we can be working much more closely with our allies and like-minded countries to ensure that um, all of the UN community um, does what they should be doing uh, under existing Security Council resolutions. And I think that as we move forward, we'll be, the US Congress will likely be looking at ways of uh, tightening up our own ability to uh, uh, implement unilateral sanctions, and that will be an important arrow in the American quiver, an important way for the United States to leverage uh, compliance from both the Chinese and other members of the international community who are less than disciplined in the way they implement the Security Council resolutions. We'll have to leave it, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you, Ambassador. It's been, I think, a very wide-ranging and illuminating conversation this evening. And uh, uh, I think the, the turnout in the room is just an indication of the, the really serious level of interest in these issues there is in this town and in this country. Uh, to bring uh, visitors of this calibre to Australia, of course, we're really grateful uh, in this instance for the US Studies Centre at the University of Sydney. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the US Studies Centre, uh, Simon Jackman, James Brown and Ashley Townsend, who's here this evening. To put on an event like this, of course, I, I thank colleagues here at the college, particularly Chris Farnham, our Policy and Events Officer, and others in the, uh, the policy engagement and events team here at the college. Um, but of course, we really rely very much on your interest, your support, uh, and as a reflection of the contribution we make to policy debate in this country. Can you please uh, join me in thanking our two speakers? <laughs>